You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Well, good afternoon to everyone out there. This is Dr. Jeff Werber. Just joining you live with another edition of Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff here on Let's Talk Pets, Pet Life Radio. So, you know, you know. first of all, I um, had a, a fun time. I'm gonna, we're going to put something up on the website for you. I was actually in New York this past weekend. I uh, got a call on Thursday, so this was not easy planning, but they want to be in New York to do a live segment on the weekend edition of Fox and Friends with uh, the new host, Tucker Carlson, who is great and who, by the way, is a major, major pet lover. He has an English Springer Spaniel and an English Cocker Spaniel, pure English Cocker, and those are just beautiful dogs. And we did a segment on the number one nutritional disease affecting pets. And for those of you that don't know, that is obesity. Over 50% of dogs and cats in the United States are overweight. That uh, equates to about 93 million overweight dogs and cats. That's a lot of overweight pets. And what's funny is about 75% of them belong to owners who themselves could lose a few, which really it lends an interesting uh, question. And, and I always, you know, we talk to veterinarians and, you know, why is it such a problem and why do veterinarians have such a difficult time educating their clients about obesity? And this, the reason is simple. They're afraid to talk to someone who is clearly overweight about the pets that are overweight for fear, and this is self-made fear, that the client is going to know that as you're talking about the pet, you're actually talking about them. So to avoid the uncomfortable situation, they choose not to talk about it at all, which of course is really not healthy for the pet. But we had a great segment. So uh, we're going to go ahead and put up the link. It was on the weekend edition of Fox and Friends on May 5th on Cinco de Mayo about fat pooches. So hopefully you'll have a chance to uh, log on, give us a, you know, a little time to put that thing up and view the segment. It, went, uh, it was a lot of fun. So um, as we get started, as you know, we're live. We're the only live show, the only call-in show on Pet Life Radio. So we need to hear from you. So give me a call at 877-385-8882. Once again, 877-385-8882. We'd love to get your questions. And if you're a little shy and you don't want to talk to me on the phone, go ahead and um, send me a question email to Dr. Jeff at PetLifeRadio.com. That's D-R-J-E-F-F at PetLifeRadio.com. I will see the email and of course I will answer your questions. So also I could not be here without our sponsor and that is ProSense Pet Products. These are veterinary approved pet products that are basically from me. And uh, they are available at your local mass retailers, a lot of specials at Walmart, Target. If you want to uh, find some really good products, you can head up to Walmart. You can go online, and uh, they actually have some really good coupons for the ProSense pet products. So I wanted to uh, share a, you know, a cute little story while you guys are getting the courage to give me a call. And um, it's about a patient of mine that we sent home yesterday. And I, and I have to tell you, and I, and I took some pictures, and I think I'm going to write a little blog on this on, on Pet Health Network, which is a network that I write for. And it's about this little dog, a Jack Russell Terrier male, 14 years old, actually pushing 15 years of age, that was literally, and I mean literally, run over by his owner. And no, not purposely. I know you knew that one. He was actually taking a little nap and to avoid the sun. And we had a hot couple of days in L.A. last week. He decided to run for some cover and find some shade under the car sitting right behind a tire. And the owner went to her closed driveway, opened up the gate, got in the car, not seeing good old Rolo sleeping comfortably, resting peacefully under the car and decided to back up. And she actually thought that one of her kids left like a toy or a part of the tricycle under the car. I mean, she actually felt the car go up and over something. She got out of the car to look, and there was Rolo, clearly sandwiched to the ground. Well, she runs to an emergency. They did some emergency treatment. This happened early in the evening and brings Rolo to us the very next day. And I'm telling you, Rolo was one unhappy dog. He could not get up. 
We were fearing the worst. Uh, I mean, the amount of problems that could have happened, you can fill a book and ranging from very serious problems like a ruptured bladder, like a broken spine, broken pelvis, broken back legs. I mean, the car ran over the hind end, Rolo's hind end. And miraculously, and I mean miraculously, there appeared to be none of those. X-rays were clean. The body wall was totally torn open, creating a huge hernia. We really had no idea how large the hernia was, but we prepared for the worst. And once we got Rolo stable, probably about five, six days later, where his color was coming back, we treated him for the shock. Uh, He was on antibiotics. He was on supportive care, started doing better each day, started to eat, was in tremendous discomfort. He was on pain meds. We uh, had our surgeon go in and it could not repair the body wall. It was just so badly destroyed. But he was able to place a, an intestinal abdominal mesh. It's like a, a mesh material that acts as the body wall. The body wall starts to heal around the mesh and in time basically creates a new fake body wall. Well, I got to tell you, yesterday we sent Rolo home. And this dog was running and jumping. You'd never know that Rolo was pushing 15. It was going to be 15 next month. And it was truly a miracle that this dog had such a will to beat these odds and how this dog was so lucky that of all the serious, potentially fatal complications, he pulled through with flying colors. And um, I think the second biggest pain, I think, was poor mom's purse. But other than that, Rolo is just doing great and uh, so happy. You know, these are the cases, you know, I often say, regardless of how good we are as veterinarians, now, regardless of how great you think your veterinarian is, the truth of the matter is that most of our cases are going to get well in spite of us, not because of us. And I got to tell you, this is one where we really felt that we had a very, very important hand in uh, saving Rolo's life. And when you send a case like that home, you just feel great. And uh, anyway, I got some great after pictures of Rolo, and uh, he's just one remarkable dog. Anyway, so still want to hear from you, 877-385-8882. We had a bunch of questions on the website and, and people that send me questions to Dr. Jeff at PetLifeRadio.com. And one of them I had to chuckle. And you'll hear why in a minute, but it's because it really, it's message for me so close to home. And that is that a woman writes and she asks about her Labrador retriever who's been having some, and again, this is, you know, this is doctor talk. We have to talk about this. I'm sure it's happened to all of you at some point. And if not, depending on the breed and it's, especially if you have a puppy, it's going to happen. And that is that he has been experiencing some very mushy stool. I, you know, I don't know why in the veterinary world that we tend to actually try to draw a mental picture for our clients as to what things look like. And one of the descriptive terms we use for stool, is it like firm, all right? Is it kind of hold shape, kind of like a cow patty? Is it kind of mushy, doesn't really hold a shape after a while, like soft serve ice cream, to ultimately watery, no shape at all? And uh, this was described by the owner as being mucousy cow patty-like. So sort of, I was able to draw a mental image, a picture in my mind of just what the stool looked like. And with mucus and sometimes a little blood, I knew right away that this is a colitis. It's a large bowel inflammation. And typically, with large bowel inflammations, it's not a serious problem. And I usually tell people that I know oftentimes these things look worse than they are. And they're really not that bad. And there's a kind of a long list of things I go through to to try to determine if I'm on the right track, if this really is just a colitis. And those are the following. Nerves, excitement, diet, diet change, eating something that he or she shouldn't have, like, you know, getting a hold of something outside, a true poison, or of course, we can't forget parasites, though often this happens in older adult dogs, and we don't think of parasites as much as we would say if it was a puppy. Well, the dog in question is, Good question happens to be a Labrador. Now, I am the proud pop to, as I like to say, two and a half Labradors because I have two Labradors and one Labradoodle. And the hallmark of a Labrador is that they will eat anything that's not bolted down or doesn't eat them first. And a lot of times when animals come in or you're talking to somebody on the phone and they're complaining about their pet is sick or as they say, ADR ain't doing right. And I often, one of the first questions I ask is, how's his appetite? And Typically, a dog who's still eating is usually not as sick as a dog who no longer wants to eat. Well, that's one question you really can't ask about a Labrador because I've seen Labradors that are quite literally on a deathbed, and yet when it comes to food, they'll somehow manage to eat. And sure enough, this lab, we call it garbage can enteritis. The owner actually has to tape up the garbage can 
and put like those, you know, those bicycle stretchy things over the garbage can lid to uh, keep it closed because the dog learned how to get the garbage can lid off. So they're very resourceful. Anyway, sure enough, it was a lab, dietary indiscretion, garbage can enteritis, call it what you will, and we were able to treat it. And I recommend for a lot of these cases, if you have a pet that has kind of mushy, ugly, mucousy, even sometimes bloody stool, that is otherwise perfect, happy, eating, playful, all of the above, then what I'd recommend, instead of panicking and rushing to go to the doctor and spending a a small fortune, sometimes a big fortune, depending on where you go, try this. Try putting them on a little bland food for a couple of days and added fiber. Now, one thing I want to sort of specify, when we talk about bland food for a small intestinal upset, we think about a uh, using some rice, white rice, which is very binding. And, it's, and so that's really good for small intestinal diarrhea that's very, very watery. When it comes to large bowel diarrhea, you want to think about the opposite. You want to think about fiber, bran, bran flakes, cooked oatmeal, psyllium, metamucil powder, canned pumpkin, things that are actually less binding, you want to almost encase the ingesta in something that's sort of soft and it's going to help it move through the colon more easily, giving the chance, the colon a chance to heal. And when it does, it'll start doing what it does best. And that is the last bit of absorption, reabsorption of the fluid coming in. It'll firm up the stool. It'll, it'll stop the mucus. And it kind of that's your, uh, the trick. So before you panic and run to the doc, as long as everything else is fine, try that first. Add a little fiber, a couple of tablespoons, depending on the size of the dog, with every meal, and that, uh, that should help tremendously. So uh, other than that, that's you know, a good way to go, but it's a really common problem, and we see it so much in puppies, and the only thing, as I said, I'd like to add to that list of possibilities in puppies would be parasites. So anyway, we'll be uh, right back here at Pet Life Radio, and you're here online with Dr. Jeff. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. Are you crazy about cats? If so, check out The World is Your Litter Box, Deluxe Edition. This clever how-to manual for cats, written by a cat named Quasi, contains more laughs than should be allowable in one book, and is poignantly underscored by the combative yet loving relationship between Quasi and his human. The World is Your Litter Box, Deluxe Edition, is guaranteed to have you laughing your tail off. So, treat yourself to a copy today, available from Amazon. Hi, this is Tim Link, animal communicator and pet expert and host of Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have you ever wanted to know what your pet is really thinking? Do you want to find out if they truly understand what you're trying to tell them? Ever wish you could build a better understanding and closer relationship with your pet? Well, now you can. Learning to communicate with animals is a four-part on-demand workshop. In the workshop, you'll learn the essential techniques that are necessary to communicate with animals, including what is animal communication, breathing correctly to achieve the perfect state to communicate with your animals at a deeper level, using guided meditation exercises and method to communicate with animals, and how to send and receive information from your animals. So if you're wanting to learn how to communicate and connect with your animals at a deeper level, visit PetLifeRadio.com forward slash workshop and purchase and download Learning to Communicate with Animals. You'll be glad you did. Dog Shelter Blues, the new novel by Mark Conkling. This hard-hitting story lights up the world of animal rescue with engaging characters and their pets, struggling with their own internal demons as they attempt to rescue innocent creatures that sometimes bring a mysterious transforming power to broken lives. Read the first chapter of Dog Shelter Blues free at dogshelterblues.com. Then come along a breathtaking journey that ends with an astonishing triumph of good over evil. Order your copy of Dog Shelter Blues today. Available at amazon.com and barnesandnoble.com. Hi, this is Marcy Davis and my service dog, Whistle, and we're your hosts of Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Working Like Dogs is the show where you can learn everything you ever wanted to know about working animals or working dogs. Whether you're a member of a working dog team or you've just seen a working dog or animal out at the mall or the grocery store and you're curious about how these amazing animals work with their human partners, then Working Like Dogs is the show for you. Join us for the inside scoop at Working Like Dogs on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Well, 
Well, welcome back to Let's Talk Pet with Dr. Jeff. I'm Dr. Jeff Werber here after a little extended break. The uh, computers are great, aren't they? But with their oh, occasional technical difficulties, uh, doing a show long distance, uh, I think things like this just sometimes happen. Anyway, we're back. That's the good news. Uh, once again, I want to thank our sponsors, ProSense Pet Products, veterinary quality pet products available to you over the counter. Save yourselves a little money. Get some really great stuff with ProSets Pet Products available at your local retailers. And always Walmart has some great specials. Go online to walmart.com and you get some coupons for some good ProSets products. Anyway, before our break, we were talking about Rick's dog in Riverside, California, who has a Great Dane, two-year-old Great Dane, that when he would wag his tail so hard that the tail, the tip of the tail would start bleeding. And first of all, we see this in a lot of dogs. We see this in the, these are dogs that have that long tail. Dalmatians are notorious. Certainly Great Danes are notorious. Dogs that have these, even like Dachshunds, any dog that has a long, skinny, skinny tail and very, very short coat where they, they have very thin skin at the base of the tail and I mean the tip of the tail. And it's unfortunately, there's very little padding there. And the, the bummer is for this is that it is so difficult to get this to stop. Why? Because, first of all, it's very hard to wrap a tail. Because the tail, think about eating an ice cream cone, right? And, you know, the cone, and the, the farther down you go towards the bottom, the narrower it gets. And, you know, even though they, they sometimes, when you buy an ice cream cone, they put them into those little cone-shaped sleeves. But, you know, how easily they just falls right out of the sleeve because, because there's nothing to hold it on. It's not wider at the bottom. It actually continues to get narrow. That's the same as a tail. Secondly, so when you have a wrap on the tail, if they wag your tail, a lot of times the wrap is going to fall off. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll take the plastic casing of a syringe. You know, those little disposable syringes we often use in practice. I'm sure you've seen them when you've taken your pets to the doctor. And uh, so we'll take one of those plastic sleeves, slide it over the tip of the tail, and then take a ton of tape and tape the sleeve to the tail. So at least now when they wag their tail, they're hitting the hard plastic and they're not hitting the tail. But I'm telling you, I have had many cases over the years where this has become such a nuisance or a continuing recurring problem that we've actually been forced to amputate the tip of the tail, cut the tail back, make it shorter by about, oh, four or five vertebrae just to help prevent this and to let this thing heal once and for all because they are such a bear to heal. So uh, what I would recommend doing for Rick is trying to wrap it. Your vet can try the syringe case plastic to put over the tip of the tail. Somehow keeping your dog away from hard walls when he is wagging his tail. I don't know. You want to, you know, almost like you, you want to put him into like um, cushioned lined walls, uh, almost like he's, the dog is in a loony bin or something. You know, we call it a padded cell. If you can come out, somehow come up with a, a padded room, then hopefully uh, he'll do better. But uh, sorry to hear it, Rick. It's not a serious problem. It's more of a nuisance problem than anything else. So once again, we're here waiting to hear from you. Uh, I'm Dr. Jeff Werber. Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff here on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. The number here to reach me, 877-385-8882. I do want to see that those phones lighting up. Uh, you can also send me a quick uh, email to Dr. Jeff at PetLifeRadio.com, and I will be happy to answer your uh, calls online. I am, let's see, I'm just looking at some of the uh, emails that we do get. Fortunately, some people aren't as shy as some others, and they do send us emails. Ah, here's one. This came from Ray in Madison, Wisconsin, who is calling about his 12-year-old Shih Tzu who has uh, bad teeth, and Ray is afraid to have him anesthetized for teeth cleaning because he's concerned about the danger at this age. He wants to know if there's a spray for the teeth. And uh, here's some of the realities. First of all, once plaque turns into tartar. Now, plaque is, a, is more or less of a film that is left on teeth, say, after a meal. And it's a mixture of food particles, some bacteria, some uncalcified minerals, debris that's left in the mouth. And this is why we recommend so frequently that no matter what you're going to do for oral care, far and away, the best thing to do is brush your pet's teeth. Get them used to it. It's really not that difficult. You can start with a finger brush. You can start with a finger. Put a little of the, the really cool poultry flavored or for a cat, fish flavored, the dentifrice, toothpaste, non-sudsing. They can swallow it. Put it on your finger. Rub it inside the mouth. Do it just before a meal, just before walk, just before playtime so they get used to it and make it fun. 
make the process fun. And by doing so, they won't object so much to the act of having their teeth brushed. But something that's critical because we need to get rid of that plaque. The problem is that once the plaque mineralizes to become what we call tartar or calculus, now we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem because brushing at this point is worthless. If you don't get this plaque off, this film off before it hardens, it mineralizes, then the only way to get it off really is through professional dental cleaning, which of course so many people are afraid of. So obviously, as with many, many conditions that we deal with in veterinary medicine, the best treatment actually is prevention. So now, Ray, in Madison, Wisconsin, we have an issue here because now your 12-year-old Shih Tzu has some heavy-duty tartar on the teeth and need they do need to be professionally cleaned. What do you do? Well, there are a lot of places, mostly, well, groomers for sure, and some services out there that claim, and I'm going to put that in capital letters, claim they can do a thorough teeth cleaning without any anesthesia. First of all, and according to many state veterinary practice codes, that might be against the law. Check with your states, but in certain states, and it should be most states, if a non-veterinarian takes a metallic instrument and scrapes away tartar from the teeth, under the teeth, meaning under the gums, right? They are, by law, by definition, practicing veterinary medicine without a license, which, of course, is against the law. Some will allow it. Most states will allow brushing at a groomer. They can brush the teeth, but they can't actually take a tartar scraper and scrape the plaque, the tartar, away from the surface of the tooth. Yet, as I know, many of you are afraid of anesthesia. And according to the veterinary dental community, and, and there are specialists in veterinary dentistry, these are veterinarians, DVMs, or from University of Pennsylvania, VMDs, that even after four years of veterinary school, chose to do an internship and a residency in veterinary dentistry, sit for their exams, and to be actually become board certified by the American Veterinary Dental College or the American Academy of Veterinary Dentistry. And they went through training. And their opinion, and I think it's, it's legit, in order to do a, a, the, the job that often should be done, needs to be done, cleaning appropriately, animal needs to be put to sleep under anesthesia, completely under anesthesia. Now, what I've done in my practice, and it's kind of a, a compromise, it does lean towards anesthesia. You definitely need a, a healthy pet, and we always check the pets out first. And that is a, a product. It's an injectable, kind of a, a sedative tranquilizer. I call it twilight sleep, using a, a medication called Dexdomator that really renders an animal pretty amenable to working with. They're kind of awake, kind of awake. I say that kind of uh, half in jest because they are sleeping, but they are aware. And I add some pain medication to that because there's not a lot of pain medication in Dextomator. And sometimes their respiratory rate and heart rate is slowed, so I always keep them on a little oxygen. And we are able to clean the teeth very well using all the equipment that we'd like to use, the ultrasonic scaler, the tartar scrapers. We really can get deep into the pockets. Obviously, not deep enough to do extractions, especially molar or major, what we call elevated extractions. And we can polish the teeth with a polishing cup and that cute little rubber thing with that tasty paste that you all have when you go to the the dentist. And the beauty is that after we're finished, we can actually reverse the Dextomator, with another injection called antecedent. And these animals get up within minutes, five, six, seven minutes, eight minutes, depending on the dog. And it is absolutely amazing. And it is the closest thing to anesthesia without full anesthesia. And I have many, many clients will opt for that because we can really do a pretty good job. But just don't think that you're a veterinarian who is insisting on general anesthesia, therefore insisting on some blood work, is trying to rip you off because they are following the actual recommendations by the board-certified veterinary dentists. Others like myself who feel that the patient is right, the teeth aren't that bad, that using a twilight-type sleep can do a good job and save the need for full general anesthesia, 
we are probably breaking some rules, but we are doing a thorough job. And if we can't, I will tell my client that, no, we can't. This needs full anesthesia, or I know we're going to have to do some extractions. I know we're going to have to do some gum work. We might have to do some gum surgery. For example, in the case of a boxer that has gingival hyperplasia, then we need to take my electric artery unit and, and remove that excess gingival tissue. For these procedures, full anesthesia is going to be required, and therefore, we, that's what we should do. But look around. I guess the really take home message here, and you know, this is for Ray. The best therapy is preventive care. If you're going to do it, you want to make sure you do it right. Do not go to a non veterinarian to have it done. You will be disappointed. Uh, there was a great study out that I will share with you next week about dogs that were followed. A study was done by one of the prominent veterinary dentists in the U.S., and he followed these dogs that had continually gone to a groomer for dentistry, and the results were shocking. So um, anyway, I think that's uh, about it for today. I want to thank you for being with me. And uh, guys, I want you to tell your friends. I want to hear from you next week. There's no excuse, no reason. 877-385-8882. This is a call-in show. I know you guys aren't used to call-in shows. You guys are used to listening to one of our great hosts on the other shows here on Pet Life Radio do their thing, talk for a half hour or an hour, but I'm here for you. I want to talk to you. I want to hear from you. And you can call me. You can send me an email. Um, I don't like talking for a whole half hour. I do it. I can do it, obviously. But I'd much rather hear from you. Get some great questions. Let's get some conversations going. And um, uh, let's kind of let's take it from there. So uh, once again, thanking ProSense Pet Products. Thanking um, uh, Walmart. And without them, I wouldn't be here. And I'm here for you. Here to answer your questions. We'll see you next week. Next Thursday, uh, same time, 8, 1 p.m. Pacific time zone, 4 p.m. Eastern time zone. And I want you equipped. Put it on your mark calendars. So get that alert to your phone that you know that you're going to call me um, uh, at 877-385-8882. Thanks for joining me, and we'll talk to you next week. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.